make speech. After my speech, we will go on. Dear colleagues, uh, good morning. I am very pleased to welcome you to the first meeting of the OEC PA General Committee on Economic Affairs, Science, Technology, and Environment within the framework of our 2023 annual session in Vancouver. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our Canadian host for excellent organization of our annual session and great hospitality shown to us. This gathering will enable us to discuss and address the intersection of major economic and environmental threats with the security of our region, especially given the critical circumstances we find ourselves in. Before we begin, allow me to express my deepest gratitude to my Vice Chair Arthur Gerasimov and our Rapporteur Gudrun Kugler, as well as to the International Secretary, particularly Marco Bonabella, for their dedication and tireless efforts in advancing our common agenda during the past year and beyond. I am very proud that we work as a team to strengthen our Assembly's contribution to economic and environmental security. Dear friends and colleagues, indeed, the OEC space is facing multiple interconnected security threats. The ongoing war of aggression by Russia against Ukraine, besides this, it is atrocious military, civilian, and humanitarian reper repercussions continues to cause connectivity disruptions, energy instability, food insecurity, and environmental degradation across the region. The sabotage of Nord Stream pipelines on 26 September 2022 and destruction of the Kakovka Dam in Ukraine on 6 June 2023, which caused extensive flooding along the Lower Dnieper River, forcing the evacuation of thousands of individuals and threatening the safety of Zaporizhia nuclear power plant are just two blatant examples of the massive social, economic, and environmental distress caused by this absurd war. Moreover, they vividly expose the vulnerability of our critical energy and civilian infrastructures, which is subject of reflection in itself. These vile men of our economies are still struggling in rebounding from the COVID-19 pandemic, and while high inflation rates and disruptions in the global trading system continue to afflict our citizens. In the meantime, the threats posed by climate change, including but not limited to extreme weather events, air, water, soil pollution, deforestation, <coughs> desertification, water scarcity, and land erosion remain a true elephant in the room. According to their latest research, in almost seven years, by 2030, the North Pole will be ice free in summer for the first time in millennia. Besides this, it is environmental impact. This will likely aggravate geopolitical tensions in the region. Moreover, the Mediterranean region has been labeled as the second fastest warming up region in the world after Arctic. The need to make our energy supply and infrastructure more secure, resilient, diversified, and the carbon nature is obvious. Yet achieving such a transition in a quick, fair, affordable, and sustainable manner remains a major challenge as shocks and the shortages should be prevented and as our citizens should not pay the bill. Finally, the unparalleled technological and digital progress we are experiencing in many sectors of society is profoundly affecting the way we learn, work, interact, and ultimately live. While there are clear benefits attached to this evolution, it is also raises serious questions. For example, is our society capable of adapting fast enough to these innovations? How are these developments impacting on use and our labor markets? Can we address the growing number of cyber threats? How do we protect our citizens from harmful content online? Will artificial intelligence eradicate and replace the human race? Clearly, there are many questions that need to be considered and answered. Dear colleagues, 
In our quest for sustainability, stability, and peace, I would like to draw your attention to the four revolutions that we will need to master in order to survive and thrive as a human society. The first is technological revolution. I think it is a crucial that we duly reflect on the transformative power of technology. We live in an era where, where technology has become an integral part of our daily lives. This comes with clear advantages as technological progress has been the key to the success of human civil civilization throughout history. For instance, as we strive to address many pressing environmental challenges, we must make use of the potential of technology to aid our efforts. From clean energy solutions to advanced monitoring systems, technology lends invaluable tools to mitigate the effects of climate change, protect natural habitats, and build a more sustainable future for all. However, while we embrace the promise of technology, we must also be vigilant about its potential risks. As the pace of innovation has become so quick, we are often lagging in making sure that no one is left behind and all new technologies are applied for the common good. In other words, the digital revolution should be framed around clear regulations inspired by widely shared ethical values. At the same time, we should engage in targeted education efforts and awareness raising campaigns at grassroots level. Finally, we should promote effective private-public partnership aimed at preventing abuses and at boosting social corporate responsibility. Essentially, we need to steer this evolution towards the common good rather than merely cope with the negative consequences if and as they arise. We hope to dedicate an OECPS special event to this critical and very complex issues soon. Second is the green development revolution. The transition to a greener development model is inevitable. To find a more harmonized way to interact with our planet and its limited resources is key to our survival. By reducing our dependence on fossil fuels, by embracing clean energy alternatives, and by planning and building smarter we can significantly cut greenhouse gas emissions, mitigate the impact of climate change, and promote long, longer-term development. And we need to do it no later but in this decade. To facilitate such a process, it is crucial that we explore innovative solutions, support research, and foster international development and cooperation. In this regard, I am proud to recall the Baku Conference organized jointly by the PA and my home country, Azerbaijan, last May, where we discussed the role of national parliaments in promoting security and stability through green economy, connectivity, and sustainable development. By, show, by showcasing practical examples of smart, of smart cities and smart villages, we have stressed that embracing eco-friendly agriculture renewable energy sources, and innovative waste management systems can transform our local communities into models of resilience and responsible environmental management. More similar events should be organized for us to be able to share best practice and learn for, from each other in the future. The third is the energy revolution. Strictly connected to the development re revolution is the energy one. The need for such revolution was already clear before the war in Ukraine. We simply emphasized the short-sightedness of our past energy policies. Diversify diversifying our energy sources is vital for our sustainable future. By reducing dependence on a single energy source, we enhance energy security and increase the resilience of our societies. While each country should carefully ponder it is energy mix, duly leveraging on the potential of clean energy sources will enable us to create more sustainable and affordable energy portfolios with clear economic and environmental benefits for all, starting from our citizens and businesses. We cannot afford to leave anyone behind in this process. 
I had an honor to personally chair a special debate on affordable, secure, clean, and sustainable energy in the OEC region, prospects and challenges during our winter session in February, which highlighted that producing, storing, and consuming clean energy should be our high priority. I am pleased to see that our rapporteur's resolution focuses much on energy security, as I believe it will be even more important in the coming years. The first is environmental revolution. Finally, we can no longer underestimate the in, uh, in, uh, inextricable links between the security and environment in which we live, drastically reducing air, soil, water pollution, and ensuring the safe handling and disposal of hazardous materials and radiation sources is principle to safeguarding our planet and citizens' health, including for future generations. Plastic pollution is particularly a worrying type of contamination, which affects virtually all ecosystems and carries hazardous implications for our health. I am glad that our committee will place we have much attention on this devastating phenomenon. Strengthening regulations, setting ambitious quality standards, building circular economies, investing in sustainable waste management systems, and empowering local communities are vital steps towards minimizing pollution, protecting ecosystems, and sustaining biodiversity. At the end of the day, whatever we do and produce has an impact on our surrounding environment, the very environment that sustains our lives and allows us to strive as a civilization. We need to be fully aware of the symbiotic relationship and mainstream environmental consideration in all our policies. This implies a true behavioral revolution. Esteemed colleagues and friends, to successfully navigate through these developments which are global in nature and affect all, all our countries, we must be Pro, protag, protag, uh, protagonists of change and not merely spectators. And we must work together to deepen partnerships beyond the OECE. For instance, I am pleased to report that our collaboration with the Mediterranean Commission of Sustainable Development steadily continues. Our Vice President Pere Pons recent visit in Marseille at the 20th meeting of the Mediterranean Commission of Sustainable Development has demonstrated the complementary mission of the PA and United Nations Environmental Program in promoting green development across the Mediterranean basin while safeguarding its dedicated environment. As the Mediterranean basin is a hotspot in terms of global warming and pollution, our engagement is both timely and appreciated. As parliamentarians, it is our duty to ensure that our citizens' concerns are duly considered while adopting relevant policies, laws, and regulations. We bear the responsibility to closely oversee the execution of crucial global obligations such as the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement on Climate Changes, as well as to keep our constituencies abreast of the challenges we face and the ways to overcome them. Personally, it has been an honor as chair of the OECPA Second Committee to actively engage over the last year to raise the visibility of our critical agenda, extend the reach of our actions, and sharpen the focus of our initiatives. I am keen to remain a protagonist of this effort. Thank you for your attention. So, dear colleagues, let me inform about this um, further agenda plan. The committee is scheduled to have four meetings during the session. In this first meeting, we will consider the draft resolution and report from the rapporteur, uh, Mr. Kugler. We will also consider amendments to this resolution if time permitting. May I remind colleagues that the election of committee officer for the next annual session of the Assembly will take place during the committee's final session, which is likely to take place on Monday morning. Under Rule 36.5, I would like to ask the committee to agree that 
The deadline for nominations for the committee officers shall be 6 p.m. on Sunday, 2 July, rather than the start of the Monday meetings as is normally, be, normally the case. This is allow, this to allow sufficient time for practical arrangement to be made ahead of our meeting on Monday morning. Are there any objections to that proposal? No, I, I don't see any, any objections. The proposal is adopted. Now we come to the debate on the report and draft resolution by Rapporteur Ms. Kudrin Kugler. The list of speakers closed at 8 a.m. this morning. But thank you, colleagues who have put their names down to, to speak. But I don't know if the time allows we can. Yeah, we can have and allow the later registration if anyone wishes to do so. Now I would like to welcome uh, to the floor Ms. Gudrun Kugler to present the report and the rough resolution to this committee. Madam Kugler, please, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everybody. Um, uh, give me a few minutes to present to you uh, the main focus of my report and the resolution. We will be talking about the details in the next couple of days, I'm aware, but I would like just to give you an overview. I am very glad that in the second committee we have a very good working atmosphere, I may say, uh, with our chair, Azai Guliev, and um, our vice chair, Arto Gerasimov, who, as you know, is not here because of the situation in Ukraine. But I really would like also to begin with greeting Arto Gerasimov and, uh, and lauding him for the uh, very uh, for the big commitment he has to this committee despite all the difficulties. I would also like to say thank you to the Secretariat. Here is Marco Bonobello, but also a lot of other people are engaged in making this possible. And one more person to mention, Tabita Rauscher, who is just standing there taking a picture of me, has also been very instrumental on making this happen because writing such a report and a resolution, as you can imagine, is a huge task. We have spent so many nights in, uh, in the spring working on this. Now you have a piece of paper, a few pages, and you're like, yeah, it's nice. But we spent uh, many sleepless nights on making it possible. So thank you also to, uh, to Peter and my staff in Vienna. Now, I uh, would like to build upon the most excellent speech that our chair just gave and uh, go into the details of the report very much based on what we have heard. Um, Security and stability in the fields of economy, environment, technology, and science is absolutely key. You know, sometimes the second committee is maybe many people don't think it's so interesting. Well, I think it is the most interesting in these times. And it was also the most forward looking because the crises we see today are solved by the approaches that we discussed in the second committee. This is about uh, the war, an unjust and unprovoked military invasion of Ukraine by the Russian Federation and its consequences. It's about inflation. It's a, still about post-pandemic recovery. And it's also about societies that have become increasingly frustrated and distressed, and especially the young people. So you see there's something that's not right and how we deal with it to a very large aspect is something that we discuss in this committee. So our chair has rightly said um, I had a focus on energy security in this report, and this is why I would like to begin with the topic of energy security. We are all very much uh, on the same page that we need to transition to clean energy, and there are a number of reasons. One is, obviously, our climate worries and concerns. Another one is geopolitical. There are still many countries in the OSCE region who heavily depend on the Russian Federation um, with regard to energy. And it is also a public health concern. You know, um, pollution harms people, and pollution doesn't stop at borders. Um, we have seen a number of examples of uh, one pollution incident in one country, but the effects largely handed down to another country, right? Uh, so we need to find common solutions. 
The same is true about water. Uh, water scarcity has direct implications on human health, on sanitation, but also on political stability. And in the OSCE region, we have 150 shared waters, rivers, lakes. So obviously, we need to find common solutions. And there's another issue that we have not talked about much, and that is microplastics. Uh, we, we need to do more research, but there are several indicators that microplastics uh, pose unprecedented, unprecedented health threats on us. And I want to thank uh, John Elder from Canada, who uh, drafted a supplementary item on this issue because my report has limited space, of course, and I was very happy to help and co-sponsor the drafting of this supplementary item. Now, so we all are on the same page that we need energy uh, security through energy diversification, yes? However, there's also things that we have to be aware of, especially as parliamentarians. Um, do we have enough electricity, right, if we focus so much on electricity? Are our grids reliably uh, supporting uh, the diversification of energy sources? Uh, researchers at, Aus at an Austrian university told me, without sufficient energy, living standards will decline. I mean, you could say that's obvious, but I think it needs to be said in a parliamentary context. And the stability of political systems and democracy is directly connected to the stable and affordable provision of energy, right? Stable and affordable provision of energy results in stability. Now, this is why um, we have to raise the flag and say energy transition must not result in a degradation of energy reliability, right? Think of, for example, the danger of a blackout. Are you discussing these in your countries? I suppose, yes, we do in Austria. Um, have we thought about ways of convening parliament for emergency legislation in case of a long blackout? Do you have uh, measures in place? That's things as parliamentarians we should think about. Now, energy transition must also not lead into a, such an increase of costs, energy costs, that mobility will be reserved to the rich, right? Um, it must also not result in deindustrialization or create major competitive disadvantages for our countries in the OSCE region versus other regions, right? So we do not want to cause economic decline because that is not good for the people and as parliamentarians we represent people. Um, we also don't want to seize and stop the development for less developed countries. Right? Because we all know that we became wealthy, or many of our countries became wealthy because of our access to cheap energy. So, this being said, the solution is clean energy transition has to be brought about through technology and science. And this is why we are here in the second committee. Science must be equipped to research and research broadly. Uh, and um, we have to cooperate in coming up with the best solutions because we cannot do this alone, we can only do this together. Uh, another concern is um, critical infrastructure, which we need to protect, and cybersecurity threats. And I, can, um, I will remind you of what happened at the Karkovka Dam, yeah, and this happened after we handed in report and resolution. This is why you do not find it referenced. But we will be finding, uh, we will find a way uh, with amendments to add this uh, into uh, our resolution. There is nuclear threats uh, if we do not protect sufficiently critical infrastructure. Um, besides this broad and big topic, there are issues in the report, such as medical security. One issue is the production of essential medication in our proximities in the OSCE region. I thought we, we could improve that. Another thing uh, in the report is the right to inclusion and participation independent of people's ability to use digital means. That is becoming an issue with the elder generation, the older generation. I mention uh, human trafficking, which has shifted to become a technology-initiated crime. I talk about the Arctic and that it needs 
peaceful economic development and the protection of its very fragile environment. I talk about food security, and there I mention the, uh, the crime of the Holodomor, which was a organized starvation of Ukrainians by Russia in the years 32 and 33, 1932 and 1933, claiming millions of lives. And you see patterns that seem to be reappearing. And I mentioned the issues of artificial intelligence and data management, which are topics that should I be re-elected as rapporteur in this committee, I would like to focus on, especially in my next report. Now, to conclude, um, motivating people to engage and contribute in the areas of concern of the second committee is key for us parliamentarians. We need people to engage in science, in public discourse. We do not need people to withdraw in frustration. And this extends especially to the young generation. So I think it makes sense to join forces and work together and to communicate all to the positive things. The more negative we speak, the more people will be frustrated and withdraw. You know, there were achievements. For example, harmful chemicals we have cut by 50% in the last decades. Um, rare species have reappeared. And, you know, I have uh, four children and my nine-year-old said, if you go and work uh, to protect the environment, do not forget to protect the reefs. Right? So beautiful, little boy. And, um, and we do see positive developments. The Great Barrier Reef has, um, uh, is showing signs of recovery, and they say it's better than it was in the last 30 years. We need to say that as well. If we do this, people will say, okay, so let's join forces and improve the situation. So instead of anxiety, I advocate to find opportunities in crisis. And OSCE is at a turning point. You could say, what, you know, where is OSCE going? What's the purpose? And maybe this is our, um, our great moment to look for new ways of cooperation in issues that we cannot solve alone. And if it's, on, it's on us to establish OSCE as the one platform who can actually do this for the entire region. In this sense, I'm very much looking forward to working with you in the next couple of days on all of these key issues. Many thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, dear uh, Kugler. You, you already said and uh, put, I mean, uh, forward the vision that you uh, want to share with us and the draft resolution that you prepare is really very much appreciated. The fact that there is relatively less uh, amendments that has been uh, tabled shows that uh, many of our colleagues really agree and appreciate what you have done so far. And I want to thank you for your hard work and also for your great cooperation. So, dear colleagues, uh, as far as I understood, we have uh, 15 uh, our colleagues who uh, has been registered as a speaker. I want to ask you, we have another maybe five minutes. If anyone wishes to get registered as speaker, please do that. Otherwise, after five minutes, I will uh, announce the, uh, the speaker list is closed. So, uh, I'd like to start from our first speaker. Uh, who is Mr. George Segure Sanchez from Portugal. To be ready, uh, Ms. Katalin Xobar of Hungary. Uh, Mr. Sanchez, thank, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I would like, uh, sorry, I would like to announce that uh, the time limit to each spe uh, sp uh, speech is three minutes. Okay. Please take into consideration while making your speech. Thank you. Please, uh, uh, Mr. Sanchez, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Dear colleagues, good morning. I'd like to point out the excellent work of the rapporteur and point out that this is certainly a document that makes the OSCE happy, proud, and help us all in the ambition that we have for our organization and for our nations. It is a report that addresses precisely one of the aspects that most conditions the security and well-being of peoples, 
the energy challenges and energy transition, essential for us to save the planet and young generations' future home. The war in Ukraine brought to Europe space an unsinkable reality and, as you already mentioned today, with serious global impacts. This crisis, that, this crisis that we are sinking in Ukraine must push us to think different and to act better. Energy is one of the most affected sectors. The, prices, the pressure on energy prices caused by fear of scarcity showed us how vulnerable we are and how important it is to have a vision for this sector. Ensuring security of supply or increasing investments in renewable energy are even more important and unquestionable in the context of our nation's defense. This war revealed that the importance of ensuring backups and resilience of our systems in order to reduce security weakness. Within security of supply, is relevant to understand whether we can do it through reinforcement of interconnections or investments in decentralization empowering the citizens. Only a strong vision can allow us to increase a spirit of cooperation and strengthen foundations for solidarity among us. I'd like to share with everyone our view that the war in Ukraine make that we are already urgent in terms of energy policies on our planet and our countries very urgent. Issues such as security of supply and investment in renewable energies have become unavoidable and discussions on security and defense. Because it does not have fossil energy, Portugal, one of the countries that advances more in renewable energies, is one of the actors in the changes of energy policies in European Union. And it's available to share this good example with all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now I want to give the floor to Madame Katalin Sobor to be followed by Mr. John Aldak of Canada. Madame Sobor from Hungary, you have the floor. Thank you, Monsieur le... Merci, Monsieur le Président. Chers collègues, la Hongrie est confrontée à plusieurs défis majeurs en ce début du XXIe siècle. Permettez-moi de présenter successivement chacune de ces difficultés. La reprise économique mondiale après la pandémie a généré une importante demande d'énergie et la crise des systèmes de distribution a entraîné une augmentation spectaculaire des prix de l'énergie. Ensuite, en raison de la guerre dans notre voisinage, l'Union européenne a commencé à construire de nouvelles structures d'approvisionnement en énergie. La situation géographique de notre pays constitue une contrainte majeure pour l'approvisionnement en énergie. La Hongrie a un accès limité aux sources d'énergie alternative. La Hongrie a réalisé d'importants investissements stratégiques dans le développement de la capacité de stockage du gaz naturel et mise en place du système d'interconnexion du gaz naturel avec six de ces sept pays voisins. Pour nous, la diversification de l'approvisionnement énergétique n'est pas une question idéologique, mais une nécessité pragmatique pour garantir que l'approvisionnement énergétique de notre pays, de la région et de l'ensemble de l'Union européenne soit assuré de la manière la plus efficace à la moins dommageable possible pour l'environnement. Les régions les plus vulnérables et les plus fragiles du monde sont confrontés non seulement à une crise énergétique, mais aussi à une pénurie d'eau propre et potable qui est un besoin fondamental pour la vie. Cet environnement invivable a déclenché des migrations mondiales, exacerbées par des conflits armés de plus en plus fréquents et étendus. Important que les membres de l'Union européenne voient accepte et agissent pour réduire les émissions de carbone au niveau mondial. La Hongrie voit clairement les risques de sécurité cachés dans les pressions migratoires 
et l'augmentation de la fréquence et de l'ampleur de conflits armés. Il est clair que la sécurité énergétique des États européens exige aujourd'hui une solution très complexe, en partie à cause de la diminution de ressources énergétiques et en partie à cause des défis posés par les réchauffements climatiques. Nous continuons donc à soutenir l'utilisation des sources d'énergie solaire, photovoltaïque et nucléaire et le, et le développement de ces capacités. La question de la stabilité de l'approvisionnement énergétique n'est pas seulement une question économique, de bien-être, de santé, mais aussi une question de sécurité fondamentale. Par conséquent, toute proposition qui limite, de la, limite la diversité de l'approvisionnement la, énergétique menace également la stabilité économique, sociale et sécurité de l'Europe. Merci. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Scoboard. Now our next speaker is Mr. John Aldag of Canada, to be followed by Ms. Susanna Amador of Portugal. John, please, you have the floor. Good morning, colleagues. And Mr. Chair, first I'd like to begin by thanking you for your uh, opening statement. I'd also like to thank our rapporteur, Dr. Kugler, for her, the its significant time and work that has gone into preparing this year's report, as well as a draft resolution, so thank you. In the past year, we've witnessed a diverse range of challenges which have highlighted the importance of the OSCEPA's OSC comprehensive approach to security. For example, the OSC region is still experiencing a variety of interrelated consequences from the COVID-19 pandemic. We must continue to consider social, economic, environmental, and other perspectives as we tackle the longer lasting effects of the pandemic. Moreover, our response to war and instability in the OCE region should not focus solely on the political and military aspects of security. As Ms. Kugler highlights in her report, the war in Ukraine has triggered economic distress, energy instability, food insecurity, and environmental degradation across our region, and this cannot be ignored. Some of the threats to our common security are not new. Climate change remains a global challenge that no country is immune from. Sadly, the situation in the Canadian Arctic demonstrates the consequences of climate change in our country. That region is warming about three times the rate of the global average. The Arctic sea ice is melting, making the region more accessible. As a result, strategic and economic interest in the Arctic is growing, and as noted in the report, the changing Arctic environment is fueling new geopolitical confrontations in the region. Building on the rapporteur's report, I would like to draw attention to two specific issues. Micro, uh, microplastic pollution and biodiversity loss. Microplastics and nanoplastics have been detected in virtually all ecosystems in the planet, including in areas where no apparent human activity happens, such as the deep sea. Microplastic contamination is of con increasing concern, not only because of its potential ecological impacts, but also because of the threats it poses to food safety, food security, and human health. I'd like to highlight some of the efforts made by the Canadian federal government to better understand and address the possible environmental and health impacts of microplastic pollution. In 2017, Canada banned the manufacture and import of personal care and cosmetic products that contain my plastic microbeads with the goal of reducing plastic pollution in our oceans, rivers, and lakes while also protecting human health. We have also led and contributed to international efforts. Canada has been a strong supporter of the creation of international, an international legally binding treaty uh, to control and reduce plastic pollution and waste. I'd also say that I have an intervention related to biodiversity loss that we'll speak to later this morning. In conclusion, I'd like to uh, point out an issue that I also believe could be further explored in the future. Economic crimes are a significant threat to the safety, security, and quality of life of citizens in the region. The important and deeply troubling issue could be a focus of the second committee's work in the coming year. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Aldak. Before giving uh, the floor to our next speaker, I want to declare that the speaker list is closed. We have 17 speakers in my list, and I, I will continue to announce uh, all the speakers and try to give the time um, I, uh, uh, the three minutes to each of the speakers, but please uh, try to be in line of the time limits. 
So uh, our next speaker is uh, Ms. Susanna Amador of Portugal to be followed by Mr. Uh, Tarmik Shri of Azerbaijan. Uh, Madam Amador, you have the floor. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning to you all, dear colleagues. I would like to congratulate Mrs. Kugler for the excellent report, a very good one. And I will focus my intervention on the women participation on earth restoration. According to the United Nations, it is time for women and girls to be at the forefront of global land restoration and drought resilience efforts. This year's campaign highlights that women have a vital stake in the health of the land, but often lack ownership over it. In all parts of the world, they face significant barriers to securing their land rights. This limits the potential for the female population to prosper from farming activities. Whereas when land degrades and water becomes scarce, women are often the most affected. Considering that the study differentiates impacts of desertification, soil degradation and trot on women and men reveal gender inequalities in relation to land ownership, access to technologies and researches for soil management. Bearing in mind that the document further emphasizes that women make valuable contributions to land restoration efforts through the recovery of traditional adaptations practice, the female population also plays a pioneer role in design and implementation of new and sustainable methods such as rainwater water pods, irrigation systems and seedling nurseries which produce straw resistant plants. It is urgent and central that in OSCA we can advocate one, access to agriculture technologies, technical training and information on climate science so that women's contributions become even broader and more effective. Second, defending the elimination of legal and cultural barriers that women continue to be subject to in many regions with discriminatory laws and practice that prevent their right to inherit land as well as access to services and researches. Many thanks for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Amador. Now I would like to give the floor to Mr. Tair Mikshili to be followed by Ms. Dora Dura of Hungary. Mr. Mikshili, please you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First of all, I want to thank Ms. Kugler for her very interesting and comprehensive works. Nice work, well done, actually. As she dedicated part of her report to energy security, I want to make more wide projection on these issues. Dear colleagues, as you know, Azerbaijan has been successfully cooperating on alternative gas supplies to Europe and has proved to be a reliable partner of Europe in ensuring an uninterrupted supply of gas notwithstanding various challenges. It, in 2022, Azerbaijan delivered 11.4 billion cubic meters to gas to Europe, which has an increase of 40% in comparison to the 8.2 billion cubic meters of 2021. This year, Azerbaijan's total natural gas export will stand at 24.5 billion cubic meters, and almost half of this volume will go to the European markets. With signing of the MOU between Azerbaijan and the EU on strategic energy cooperation, the parties strengthened their long-lasted partnership in stable and reliable gas supplies to the European Union, but also laid foundation for cooperation in clean and green energy, decarbonization and climate actions. The expansion of the source and gas corridor to the 20 million cubic meters per year will play a major role to secure a gas supply for South Eastern Europe and for the Western Balkans. Green electricity interconnections between the European Union and Azerbaijan is an important part of our energy dialogue with the European Union. The launch of Azerbaijan, Georgia, Romania, Hungary, Black Sea Submarine Cable Project will redefine regional energy map and accelerate transition to the green energy. Today we have a strong interest from our partners, including Bulgaria and Serbia, to join this project. Dear colleagues, except for opportunities, there are challenges in renewable energy also. For example, grid management with unpredictable environments, evolving energy policy and regulations, increased cybersecurity risk from expanded infrastructure, technology for rising job demands. 
We think about it that to meet these challenges, we need for more cooperation and solidarity. For this purpose, Azerbaijan needs for to integrate risk management system on global level. We have to support each other. I hope that OCCPA platforms is one of these unique opportunities, and I call all the countries to join Azerbaijan initiatives. Thank you very much for your support. Thank you, Mr. Mikshle. Uh, I'd like to give the floor to Ms. Dora, Dora of Hungary and to be followed by Ms. Yara Sachs of Canada. Madam Dora, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I would like to talk about strategic issues such as the war, the COVID crisis, and the situation of mothers. I am speaking on behalf of my party. Much more than a year after the outbreak of the war, we must ask whether the policies pursued by Europe are capable of serving our interests, improving our economy, and bringing the war to an end. It is now clear that they are not. Even the IMF is forecasting that Russia's economic growth will overtake Germany, Europe's largest economy, both this year and in 2024 too. While this war is the worst thing that could happen to Europe, almost every politician are talking about that was unprovoked. Do you know that the Ukrainian government continues to remove monuments, flags, text, and they, they ban the use of minority languages in everyday life, including education and public administration, threaten and terrorize minority community leaders, as they did to indigenous Hungarians, and the, at the same time, they expect the support of Hungary. The best thing we can do for the people threatened by war is to make an end to the conflict immediately. Europe is now losing Russia, one of its most important export markets and one of its most reliable suppliers of cheap energy and raw materials, without which its competitiveness on the world, world market will be severely damaged. This certainly cannot be in Europe's interest, and therefore an autonomous European position is needed. Our primary interest is peace bringing the warring parties to the negotiating table and reaching an agreement. I also have to talk about the lessons of the COVID crisis because these have not been adequately drawn by international public opinion. It turned out that the EU leadership had corruptly obtained the experimental vaccines which were forced on so many people. And what about the responsibility? It is not acceptable for us to uh, make the level of, the, of restriction of uh, national sovereignty in this matter. And last but not least, let me also say a few words about the situation of mothers, as I am uh, the mother of four children, and I consider the issue of demography to be the most important in the 21st century for Europe and for my country, Hungary. I sincerely believe that we can only preserve our country if we focus on supporting the families living there. We have to face the fact that with such demographic indicators, public finances will simply become as unsustainable in two or three decades' time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Madam Dura. Now I'd like to give the floor to Ms. Yara Sachs of Canada and to be prepared Ms. Christine Tillman of Romania. Madam Sachs, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to the many delegates and members who are here today. I'd like to begin by thanking Ms. Kugler for your work. You've, de you've done a detailed report. You and I have had some previous discussions and I look forward to sharing my thoughts today with the committee. I'd like to connect to one specific theme in terms of women, women's economic security and the need to ensure access to affordable childcare, something we've been seized with in Canada for the past several years. The report of the second committee underlines that the full economic participation of women in society is fundamental to building stable, sustainable, and prosperous societies. And the report calls on governments to enhance social and labor protections for women and mothers and to guarantee equal access for women to the labor market and the economy. I fully agree with these points and recommendations. Creating the conditions for women's economic empowerment is good economic policy, 
and when women join the labor market, economies grow and productivity increases. It's equally good social policy. The equal and meaningful participation of women in the economy is integral to social stability. Women who are economically empowered invest in their families and communities, spurring economic growth and poverty reduction and creating more secure societies. Yet despite the vast benefits associated with women's economic empowerment, the gap between men and women in labor force participation remains wide. According to the International Labor Organization, globally speaking, there is a 30% difference in labor force participation between men, women and men aged 25 to 54. The economic impact of this gap is not trivial. The World Bank estimates that closing the gender employment gap could raise GDP per capita by nearly 20% on average globally. Investing in our women and children is a good return on investment for our societies and for our democracies. We know that COVID-19 during the pandemic exacerbated economic inequalities for women. And as my colleague, the Honorable Dr. Hetty Fry pointed out in her 2022 gender report, the pandemic deepened pre-existing gender inequalities, further widening the labor and participation gap. The research is clear, we need to do more. And in Canada, we have been. In the last two years, all 10 provinces and territories have signed agreements with the federal government in the amount of $30 billion of investments to create 250,000 childcare spaces in a national, high quality, affordable, inclusive childcare system. This is something we are fundamentally proud of as it creates affordability for families, access for women to the labor force, and empowers them to be equal partners in the development and the growth of our social and economic success. The Government of Canada has continued to work on this creation of a national child care system to ensure that early learning is accessible to every child in every place across this vast country. Currently, we just passed C35 in our legislative system, which is an act to ensure um, preserving and respecting the access to child care across Canada. It received uh, complete consensus, unite, uh, unified consensus in the House of Commons and is now in the Senate for further review. I am pleased to be joined here today by my colleague, Senator Rosemary Moody, who will be steering this important legislation for affordable child care through our legislative process. I encourage all delegates to talk to us here during the course of the next few days to understand how important affordable child care is for the empowerment of women in our societies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Sachs. Now, before giving the floor to our next speaker, I would like to ask kindly to give the copy of a speech to our secretariat for the interpretation purposes. Our interpreter needs to have beforehand the copy of your speech in order to make it easy to translate. Thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, Ms., uh, I would like to give the floor to Ms. Christina Telma of Romania and to be followed by Mr. Christos Senekis of Cyprus. So, Madam Telman, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Dear colleagues, first of all, I uh, would like to thank the rapporteur, uh, Mrs. Kudrun Kugler, for the extensive report of our committee. At uh, the level of our organization, we emphasize both the importance of energy transition for our climate and the fact that this process must not create new poverty traps or leave anyone behind. Therefore, in evaluating the progress towards our climate goals, it is important to consider the specific national circumstances, such as different starting points, the scale of efforts, and the reforms that need to be undertaken. Equally, it is important to maintain a balance between the need to achieve the green transition and the opportunity of using national internal energy resources. Environmental protection cannot be achieved in isolation. It must be a global effort, cooperation, and interconnectivity with our trusted global partners, and therefore essential. Romania welcomes the fact that the Union is now more energy secure, less dependent on Russia, more resilient to external shocks, and more forward oriented. To further strengthen its resilience, it is important that the EU countries do work on diversifying its energy, energy supply, deploying more renewables, reducing energy demand, and properly preparing for the winter seasons. Romania aims to increase production capacities 
from internal sor sources, both in terms of primary energy resources, such as Black Sea uh, deposits and renewable resources. In the context of the climate transition, Romania strongly supports maintaining the role of natural gas and the nuclear, nuclear, nuclear energy in this trans transformative process. This decision is essential for our energy security, but also for maintaining the competitiveness of our economy. By taking advantage of the progress in technology, such as the development of small modular nuclear reactors, we can move forward with our climate goals in an effective, inclusive and cost-effective manner. In the end, please like me to wish our hosts a happy Canada Day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Telman. And I would like to give the floor to Mr. Christos Senekis and to be followed by Ms. Maria Karpetian of Armenia. Mr. Senekis, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Dear colleagues, firstly, I would like to thank Mrs. Kukler for an excellent draft resolution and report. Strengthening regional security is a key theme of this assembly, and in doing so, fostering democracy and inclusivity is critical. If we all agree that political stability needs to be maintained in order to be able to achieve our goals, we have to recognize that the ongoing Russian invasion in Ukraine is a significant source of instability, as well as the Cyprus problem with the ongoing Turkish military occupation of Cyprus is a constant source of instability in the Eastern Mediterranean region. This is why the newly elected President of the Republic of Cyprus, Mr. Nikos Christodoridis, is making a new effort to restart negotiations. And in this new effort, we very much count on an increased engagement of the European Union. We very much hope that Turkey will pos pos positively respond to this new effort without continuing to set prerequisites such as the demand for a two-state solution that are entirely outside the scope of the pertinent UN resolutions. Economic security is another key aspect of the OSCE comprehensive security approach as it impacts the daily lives of all citizens. The Russian invasion in U Ukraine beyond the huge humanitarian crisis is bringing continuous increases to the cost of living expenses. It is bringing an increased risk of economic recession and eventually of social unrest. In this context, the shift to affordable energy from green sources is a key requirement that can contribute to sustainability and economic recovery at the same time. Cyprus can play a key role in efforts to overcome the energy crisis, providing a reliable alternative energy path to Europe, which may include natural gas as well as renewable energy. But regional cooperation is the key for these efforts to succeed. The potential of the Eastern Mediterranean to function as an energy corridor is huge, but for this to happen, regional tensions must subside. This is why we have to make it clear that revisionism in any case and in any area will not be tolerated and will not produce any gains. Human security is another key factor. As the asylum seekers in flux continues to run high in Cyprus, we are taking every possible measure to avoid a tragedy like the one recently happened near Pilos. However, all countries of the area must agree to cooperate in good faith and this includes Turkey, of course, where the flows towards Cyprus are mostly coming from. Thank you very much, and happy Canada Day. Thank you very much, Mr. Senekis. Now I'd like to give the floor to Ms. Maria Karapetian of Armenia and to be followed by Ms. Deirdre Brock of United Kingdom. Madam Karapetian, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, dear colleagues, I would like to start by acknowledging the work of our rapporteur, Dr. Kugler. I want to underline a specific idea she mentioned in the presentation of the report. Uh, she said that as we talk about problems in the area of economy and environment, we need to make sure that these do not generate anxiety and cause the withdrawal of our citizens. And we need to make sure that, that we generate also enough optimism so that we seek for solutions together. I think this is a 
very important conceptual approach, and I wanted to underline that for a moment. I would like also to take a few uh, minutes to talk to you about the situation in the South Caucasus. Armenia and Azerbaijan are conducting peace talks, as you know. The goal that Armenia pursues in these peace talks is the signing of a peace treaty with Azerbaijan, uh, which will allow both countries to mutually recognize each other's territorial integrity based on their internationally recognized borders. Armenia recognizes the territorial integrity of Azerbaijan, including Nagorno-Karabakh, with the understanding that the rights and security of the Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh need to be discussed in a dialogue between Baku and the representatives of the Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh with international presence for such a dialogue. Meanwhile, it has been seven months since Azerbaijan keeps the Lachin Corridor blocked. That means that the Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh are completely surrounded by the Russian peacekeepers and the Azerbaijani army. A week ago, Azerbaijan installed blocks made of concrete on the road in the Lachin Corridor. There is footage of this in, on the internet. Currently, the flow of humanitarian aid to Nagorno-Karabakh has stopped as well. No gas, no electricity, and no replenishment of food and medical supply. Patients in a critical condition and in need of medical services that are not available in Nagorno-Karabakh also cannot be transported out. And there is no international presence to document and address all of this. This is a humanitarian crisis that also has many other dimensions to it, among them environmental and economic. To illustrate the situation in very simple terms, People in Nagorno-Karabakh are not buying and selling things for already seven months. They are simply waiting in their homes for food to arrive. The life of people is at a standstill and under the constant threat of attack. As desperate as this situation is, our position in Armenia is that we will not be provoked and discouraged from the peace talks by this. We will continue to engage in good faith and with political will to bring stability and peace to the South Caucasus. For this, we need sustained international support to contain Azerbaijan's aggressiveness. After all the hardships that the people of the South Caucasus have gone through in the past decades, there is a historic chance to establish peace between the Republic of Armenia and the Republic of Azerbaijan. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Karapetian. Uh, now I would like to give the floor to Ms. Deidre Brock of United Kingdom and to be followed by Ida Glansman Hankerer of Switzerland. As I'm sorry if I pronounce wrong your name, Madam Hankerer. So, uh, Madam Brock, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Oscar is characterized by a broad-based approach to security, and I applaud the scope and ambition of the committee's report and draft resolution. It rightly highlights security is intrinsic to the world's most pressing and existential challenges, and it's essential for international bodies like the Oscar to recognize and promote the interconnected nature of these issues and develop holistic solutions. Uh, one must, first and foremost, echo the many condemnations that have been made of Russia's unprovoked and unjustified military invasion of Ukraine and the devastating humanitarian impact. The conflict has, of course, had wider in, uh, consequences for the OSCE region, and the resolution rightly highlights the undermining of economic security, part of a perfect storm along with the lasting effects of the pandemic and the escalating climate crisis. A core issue underlying these crises is the volatility of global and national energy markets, and the resolution rightly expresses concern over the continued reliance on fossil fuels and emphasizes the importance of a swift but just transition to clean and renewable sources. In Scotland, our government has set a key objective to enhance security and self-sufficiency while bringing down household bills. By 2030, we aim to generate 50% of Scotland's overall energy consumption from renewable sources, and by 2050, we aim to have decarbonised our energy system almost completely. More than 60% of the UK's onshore wind install capacity is generated in Scotland, and we're home to the 
two of the world's largest operational floating wind farms, with a third under development. And last year, the Scottish Government made a landmark commitment to offshore wind development, awarding permits to projects with a combined potential generating capacity of more than 28 gigawatts. Scotland's very proud, too, to host the Europe, uh, European Marine Energy Centre in Orkney, the world's leading wave and tidal energy test centre. And through programmes like Wave Energy Scotland, we've fostered collaboration with 275 organisations from 18 different countries to advance wave energy technologies. The rapporteur, while speaking to this excellent report, rightly spoke of finding common solutions. We want to harness our abundant natural resource, renewable resources to generate affordable green electricity at home while supporting the decarbonisation efforts of industries across Europe and beyond. Uh, I've very much appreciated hearing the diverse contributions today. The, this opportunity to exchange ideas is very welcome, both in relation to environmental efforts as well as wider security challenges. Uh, it's crucial now, though, that these discussions between partner members of the OSCE translates into concrete action. I think this report it will get us along uh, the way to that um, very well, and I look forward to seeing those actions develop. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Brock. Now I'd like to give the floor to Ms. Ida glansman hankerer of Switzerland and to be followed by Mr. Michele Moratore of San Marino. Madam Hankerer, you have the floor. Besten Dank, Herr Vorsitzender. Sehr geehrte Frau Abgeordnete Gudrun Kugler, wir bedanken uns für diesen Rapport, welchen wir sehr gut finden. Wir begrüßen es, dass die vielfältigen Probleme unserer Gesellschaft und unserer Umwelt hier aufgeführt werden und hier in diesem Bericht zusammengefasst werden. Ganz besonders bedanken wir uns, dass unsere Intervention vom Frühjahr in Wien aufgenommen wurde und die Problematik der demografischen Veränderungen in diesem Bericht ebenfalls ersichtlich ist. Mit der Veränderung und ganz besonders mit der Überalterung der Bevölkerung wird sich die Gesellschaft und auch die Wirtschaft mit neuen Herausforderungen befassen müssen. Der Fachkräftemangel ist heute eine Realität. Überlegungen zu machen, wie die Leute allenfalls länger in den Arbeitsmarkt eingebunden werden können oder wie das Wissen dieser Leute auch in Zukunft für die Forschung, die Wissenschaft und die Wirtschaft eingesetzt werden kann, ist wichtig und fordert uns alle. Darum unterstützen wir diese Aussagen und finden es wichtig, dass dies ein Teil dieses Berichtes ist. Und ich unterstütze oder wir unterstützen unsere Rapporteurin und sind mit ihr einverstanden, dass die OSZD in der Zukunft neue Herausforderungen haben wird. Und genau dieser vorliegende Bericht eine gute, gute und umfassende Grundlage dafür darstellt. Besten Dank für diese großartige Arbeit. Thank you very much, Madam Hankeler. And now I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Michele Moratori and to be ready, Mr. Ulrich Nielsen of Sividen. Mr. Moratori, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to speak in my language in Italian. Grazie, Presidente Gulayev. Grazie, cari colleghi. Innanzitutto vorrei ringraziare Zai per la preziosa introduzione. Credo che siano eh, stati toccati diversi temi molto sensibili e credo che essere qui nella bellissima Vancouver sia un'opportunità da saper cogliere. Le tematiche ambientali, oltre chiaramente quelle economiche, sono un tema particolarmente caro, a maggior ragione in un contesto geopolitico internazionale estremamente precario. L'errore più grande è quello di abbassare la guardia sulle battaglie che come noi parlamentari abbiamo il dovere di portare avanti per dare un futuro sostenibile non per noi ma per i nostri figli e per i nostri nipoti. Ogni giorno perso è un giorno che si aggiunge al punto di non ritorno. Possiamo sicuramente affermare che quel punto, determinato dalla simmetria nei meccanismi di retroazione, sta determinando impatti sostanziali e largamente diffusi su tutto il sistema Terra. Voglio pensare a quello che sta succedendo nella zona artica, ma anche nell'Asia centrale, ad esempio con il lago Daral. 
La relatrice Googler, che ringrazio, ha sottolineato il tema dell'indipendenza energetica, che si tramuta poi anche in sicurezza energetica e anche quello dell'approvvigionamento idrico, tematiche sempre più attuali. Ma questa transizione energetica verso politiche green, che ha purtroppo tempi troppo lunghi e spese a volte insostenibili per tanti Paesi che sono ancora in ritardo sulla tabella di marcia, non solo nello spazio OSCE. Per questo credo che sviluppare un piano operativo da portare avanti tutti insieme sia funzionale e non possiamo permetterci di lasciare indietro nessuno. Quello che stiamo discutendo è un documento molto preciso ed estremamente stimolante che Paesi piccoli come, eh, come il mio possano combattere al fianco delle superpotenze nell'affrontare queste sfide. E credo che l'Agenda 2030 dell'ONU con i suoi 17 SDGs deve essere il mantra per ogni futuro programma di governo. E sono completamente persuaso dal fatto che serve una rivoluzione culturale che parta proprio dai nostri parlamenti. E come Repubblica di San Marino, paese di 61 km quadrati, faremo la nostra parte. Una, un piccolo orgoglio personale che voglio menzionare. San Marino ha investito tanto ne, sull'energia prodotta da fotovoltaico e per questo siamo il sesto produttore mondiale per produzione pro capite. Ma vorrei inoltre sottolineare un altro tema che ritengo particolarmente importante, che è quello della gestione dei rifiuti. E mi piacerebbe stimolare un dibattito anche su questo tema e cercare una soluzione di sostenibilità. Perché se è vero che la riduzione dell'utilizzo delle plastiche, ad esempio, è un ottimo traguardo, noi dobbiamo implementare i nostri sforzi. Per questo apprezzo tantissimo il tema supplementare sulle microplastiche. Grazie ancora, Presidente. Grazie molto, uh, Mr. Muratori. E vorrei dare la parola a Mr. Ulrich Nielsen, di Sividen, e di seguire da Mr. David Stogmler, di Austria. Mr. Nielsen, you have the floor. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Dr. Kugler, for this report. Uh, when I read the report, I can see that it consists of several parts. And initially, there is a description of the background, which is mainly devoted to the situation in Ukraine. And then there are principles for the development of societies. Uh, I do miss the link between these two statements. Uh, it's nothing to discuss that many aspects of the development are covered and are worth taking care of. But I think also we need to consider the fact that when Russia's war in Ukraine ceases, then we see a tremendous need for rebuilding Ukraine because there have been a massive destruction. It will need support and help and cooperation when it comes to the rebuild civil society, rebuilding industry, economy, infrastructure, you name it. And therefore, I think it's time now that we, the friends of Ukraine, standing side by side and do what we can to, shall we say, plan and prepare for the situation where the rebuilding of a state need our support and also will influence our economy and our society quite severe for a number of years. It's now we have the time to say to Ukraine, we stand beside you in the war, but we will do it even afterwards because you are our friends. So therefore I would like to, for the coming year, or at least give to all people here on this meeting, the idea that consider how can we prepare for entering Ukraine into, the, into our cooperation again as a full worthy member and how can we help you to achieve that. So therefore my humble proposal is that in the coming year start to pre prepare our actions to support Ukraine when the Russian war in Ukraine has ceased. Thank you for the floor. Thank you, Mr. Nielsen. Now I would like to give the floor to Mr. David Stogmuller of Austria and to be followed by Ms. Kari Herringsen of Norway. Mr. Stogmuller, you have the floor.
Thank you, dear chair, dear colleagues. I, first of all, I want to very thank you to Mr. Gudrun Kuglar for this excellent work and all of your team. It's a, it's a very good report and thank you very much for this work. Um, dear colleagues, uh, this is a very timely resolution. Um, we are facing globally a number of crises that all connected and self-reinforcing. Russia has brought a war back to the very middle of uh, the OECD region, causing so much suffering and destruction. The climate crisis can be felt globally, countries under water. We see cities into smoke, think about New York. Uh, and new tech like uh, AI offers many new possibilities, but also new dangers. We have to talk in the future. And the Committee of Economy, Affairs, Science and Technology and the Environment stands at the very center of all of these questions. And um, paragraph seven in this draft resolution, I think it's a very good example of this and directly notes the important but understated uh, effect that Russians' hostilities in the Ukraine have on the environment. Let me be clear, the suffering that Putin's actions cause on the Ukraine civils, uh, civilian population, in practical, uh, the effect on women and children, is of course the most important dimension of this war. But we must also not lose the sight of the bigger picture and the effect of Russia's horrid war on the environmental in Ukraine. The breadbasket of the world can and will have serious effect globally. Colleagues, I think the resolution here does not go far enough. Let's call Putin's action what they are. It's an ecocide. It is a willful, a cynical destruction of the environment for his military and political gain. Uh, let's be clear, this action war crimes, the suffering caused by the destruction of the Kakovka Dam alone caused death and destruction, all of a small tactical gain for the Russian troops. It was only a small thing for them, but we should treat them as war crimes and punish them like it too. I think it is it. Nevertheless, I urge all of my colleagues to vote for this resolution. It addresses challenges that we so often lose sight of in a time of war, inflation and climate breakdown. Microplastic pollution, for example, sustainable but rapid expansion of our energy supply and storage capacities. The risk as well as the potential of artificial intelligence on democracy and society. All of these are questions that this generation of decisions makers will have to answer. We need to address them today and this resolution is an important step in that direction. Because above all, it, restar, uh, it restates the belief that we all here have today and share, we believe in a multilateral, in an international cooperation, that together we can address and deal with the poly crisis facing us today, to leave behind a livable, a livable but also equitable and safe world for the next generation and that we have to work on it. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Stogmuller, and I would like to give the floor to Ms. Kara Henriksen of Norway to be followed by Ms. Yevgenia Kravchuk of Ukraine. Dear Henriksen, you have the floor. Thank you, Asai, and thank you and Gudrun for your good work in the committee and especially for your very good report, Gudrun. Uh, first, I'd like to follow up with uh, Mr. Nielsen's uh, uh, mentioning of the need for a support program for Ukraine. And Norway has uh, uh, launched a Nansen support program over five years with 7.5 billion euros just in, uh, to rebuild uh, infrastructure and mil giving military support and uh, helping the uh, Ukrainian to rebuild the society. And this is a um, um, political, all the political parties in Norway support this. And together with Canada, I would like to, to focus on the Arctic area. And together with Canada, Norway are amongst the seven, eight countries that is bordering Arctic. And due to the uh, climate changes, this area has a big potential for real conflicts in the future. The tension are arising. In the line of our commitments and values in OSCE EPA, it is therefore important that we prevent this tension to escalate and um, be um, very effective in our work to try to prevent this escalation. 
with dialogue and uh, we have uh, to be engaged in this area so that we can prevent this uh, situation to escalate. And um, as you said, Gudrun, uh, the crisis can create opportunities and I would like the, that the OSCEPA sees this as an opportunity to really go into the Arctic area to prevent further escalation of this, uh, both the climate changes, of course, and also the uh, conflict uh, situation in this uh, area. And I will further give my reasons uh, for the proposed uh, amendments uh, when they are tabled later today. Thank you. Thank you, dear Kari. Um, now I'd like to give the floor to Ms. Yevgenia Kravchuk of Ukraine to be followed by Mr. Turagen Jeliev of Azerbaijan. Mr. Ma uh, Madam Kravchuk, you have the floor. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Madam Rapporteur, uh, dear colleagues, well, first of all, congratulations to our incredible host who is Canada Day. Um, Indeed, this uh, report is very important, but it is lacking the last information. And as uh, a rapporteur uh, said, that it does not include anything about uh, Kahoka Dam and the echo site, uh, which is in Ukraine be because of Russian aggression. By the way, I would like to underline and to thank those co colleagues that used the right terminology. It's not conflict, it's not crisis, it's not war in Ukraine, it's war of aggression of Russian Federation against a sovereign state, Ukraine. And now when we speak about the results of this aggression, we should speak about the ecological dimension. So Kohovka Dam is situated on the occupied territory. So Russians are responsible for blowing it up. They control this territory for more than a year. Uh, this dam was 30 meters high. Because of its destruction, deliberate destruction, uh, the Kahovka Reservoir is completely drained. It's one of the biggest reservoirs in Ukraine, just to, uh, to give you um, w w what it was, uh, as Great Salt Lake City in Utah. Uh, 20,000 of species, both birds, animals, um, are in danger of, uh, you know, of, of, of being eliminated, uh, and a lot of them are in the Red Book. 11 nature parks are very affected. Two UNESCO Biosphere uh, reserves were uh, uh, affected. 150 tons of garbage of dead animals were brought to Black Sea and uh, actually now other countries are experiencing. It's a huge uh, problem for um, uh, many countries, not just Ukraine, for the, whole, for the whole region. And also it will affect the food security because Kahovka Reservoir was used to irrigate three regions of Ukraine uh, and, uh, and now uh, we will see the results um, on the global food security because this Russian uh, war crime. So I urge a rapporteur to put this um, amendment, um, uh, um, some formulation about this uh, catastrophe, which is the biggest catastrophe, ecological catastrophe uh, in Europe since Chernobyl uh, nuclear power plant uh, uh, um, accident. Uh, and we need to acknowledge that Russia did it deliberately, and uh, it's another war crime made by Russian Federation in Ukraine. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Madam Kravchuk. Now I'd like to give the floor to our last speaker, uh, Mr. Troy Genjeliev. Please, Mr. Genjeliev, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, with regard to what has been said by the representative of Armenian delegation, I would like to say the following. Armenia's support of Azerbaijan's territorial integrity could have been welcomed if it wouldn't be in contrary to real actions of this country. Actions undertaken by Armenia aims at undermining the process of post-conflict normalization between Armenia and Azerbaijan and continue illegal military presence in the sovereign territories of Azerbaijan. As to the situation on the Lachin Road, presenting, presenting it as a blockade or ethnic cleansing is nothing but false propaganda. Azerbaijan has never created impediments for the movement on the road for humanitarian purposes. 
In fact, it was Armenia who attacked the checkpoint in an attempt to create obstacles for the safe and unimpeded passage of Armenian residents along the Lachin Road. We should not forget that this attack occurred when Armenia's persistent efforts to discourage Armenian residents from using the Lachin border checkpoint had failed and Armenia chose this way to stop the movement. Dear colleagues, it's deplorable that as foreign ministers of Azerbaijan and Armenia continue to make progress on the peace treaty and normalization of relations, as evidenced by the recent round of the negotiations this week in Washington, the Armenian delegation to the OECPA continues to make warmongering statements which disregard the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Azerbaijan. References to fake geographical localities in Azerbaijan non-existent under international law and domestic legislation demonstrate that declarations of Armenia at the highest level on respect for territorial integrity of Azerbaijan contrast with the actions of Armenia, including its parliamentary delegation to the OECPA. It demonstrates that the revanchist forces still prevail in Armenia, unfortunately. Azerbaijan remains committed to the normalization agenda on the basis of mutual recognition of sovereignty and territorial integrity. At the same time, Azerbaijan will continue defending its sovereignty and territori territorial integrity. So these are the thoughts that I w wanted to share with you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Genjariev. Uh, by that, <clears throat> we concluded the list of speakers. I would like to thank all of you for your wonderful intervention and a very important contribution. And uh, I'd like to announce that tomorrow we will start at 9 p.m. and to consider the 9 a.m. and to consider the, our uh, the draft resolutions, I mean the amendments to the draft resolution. So thank you very much again. See you tomorrow at 9 a.m. Thank you.